What is the definition of life? For a long time, people have thought that we've worked out all the ways that life can exist on this earth. There's the plants, the fungi, the multicellular animals, the archaea, the bacteria, and the protists. But this particular creature doesn't fall into any of these categories, and its existence has sparked one of the greatest debates in modern science. If you were to observe these organisms under a microscope, you'd see them propel themselves around, moving forward, backwards, sometimes spinning in a circle. If you were to scatter some particles around them, they will round them up and make little piles, organizing the debris. Their motion and behavior even resemble that of other microscopic organisms. They are motile, can heal damage, retain information, and even work together. But these organisms were not born out of millions of years of evolution. They were instead designed by computers and built by human hands. Xenobots, as they are called, are synthetic life forms, or living robots, and consist of two things skin cells and heart cells from the frog Xenopus lavis, after which they are named. They are the first man-made organism and an entirely new type of living system. And one day, scientists hope that they will help us monitor radioactivity, combat pollution, or even cure disease. When they were first created, Xenobots were already testing the boundaries of how we define life. But then, something truly startling happened. They started to spontaneously reproduce, making new copies of themselves in a way that science has never observed before. How is it possible for scientists to create a new type of life form? And why did they in the first place? How will these tiny creatures one day be of great use to us? And what can they tell us about the nature of life itself? Sometimes called soft robotics, the field of biorobotics is a relatively new one. Much like classic robotics, it aims to solve human problems by constructing machines. But instead of using steel, nuts, and bolts, the key raw material for biorobotics is living tissue. It's a discipline that integrates biology with mechanical design. Biohybrid robots are generally composed of muscle tissue, either cardiac or skeletal, and an artificial scaffold. And the benefit of using biology in robotics is substantial. Biological components have unique characteristics that artificial materials can't exactly replicate. Their greater flexibility enables them to move more like living organisms than machines. They can also quickly and naturally respond to external stimuli. Some could even heal from damage or injuries. Artificial structures are also prone to entropy, the gradual decline into disorder, the crumbling of concrete, the rusting of metals, the breakdown of plastics. But living organisms are in a constant battle against entropy. They preserve their internal order by taking energy from their surroundings. This quality alone could allow biobots to far surpass the useful lifetimes of even our best artificial technologies. One of the earliest examples of soft robotics is this creation, made in 2014. It's composed of a plastic backbone, surrounded in heart muscle tissue from a mouse. By pulsing current in the liquid media at different frequencies, the muscle cells are told to contract, and the biohybrid is made to walk, albeit in a very jerky way. A year later, this idea was refined, this time using sea slug muscles. This biohybrid was designed after a sea turtle, so it can move more easily through its aquatic environment. Other biorobotics focus on articulation, aka a robot that has arms or legs that can be used to manipulate its environment. This biohybrid is an articulated limb with muscle tissue attached to an artificial backbone. By changing the voltage on the left or right side, the muscles compress or contract, causing this articulation that can be used to pick things up or move things around. This biohybrid was inspired by a jellyfish. It uses an artificial scaffold with layered heart tissue on top of that. The biohybrid moves in a very similar way to a real jellyfish. And more recently, scientists have created a light-controlled stingray. It's a stingray shape made out of an artificial backbone that is layered with rat heart muscles. 
Instead of being directly activated by electricity, these muscle cells have been programmed to be activated by light. This way, you can drive the robot around by shining lights on either the right or left hand side. But for all these machines to work, outside input is needed for them to know how to behave. Electricity or light supplied by a human. Plus, the artificial components can break, and if used in the environment, are not biodegradable, and in the body, not biocompatible. And the biological components are being used just as an actuator. They are just providing the machine with motion as a motor would. But cells can do so much more than just contract. There's an entire world of innate behavior and rich biochemistry that could be utilized in cellular machines. And on top of all of that, the form of these biorobots all resemble existing organisms. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but what useful shapes and forms might exist out there that we can't even imagine? We model machines based on creatures we see around us, because it would be impossible to predict the behavior of some totally random configuration. That is, until now. Enter the Xenobot. Xenobots were born out of a goal to make an entirely biological robot with no artificial components. A robot built from the ground up, using only animal cells, taking shape not based on any existing life form, but in a totally novel configuration. And it all starts with a frog embryo. After a frog egg is fertilized, it forms into a ball of stem cells. This clump of cells looks completely uniform, but in reality, all of these cells have a predetermined purpose, a fate of what they're meant to become. The cells on top generally become epidermis or part of the central nervous system. The cells in the middle form the muscles, and the cells on the bottom form the endoderm, which leads to the development of organs. These different sections can be disassembled into their different components, and then reassembled in a new arrangement. This D and reconstruction is done entirely by hand using forceps. The desired sections of the embryo are removed, then basically mushed back together. They are then bathed in a media that causes them to stick together, and they re-adhere into a sphere. Then, the spheres can be sculpted into new shapes using a cauterizer. The formation of the bots is done by human hands, but the design isn't human at all. It comes instead from a complex artificial intelligence. A program called VoxCAD creates a virtual environment, complete with real-life simulations of physics, like gravity, friction, liquid physics, and surface tension. And in this environment are small cubes, called voxels, that represent the cells of a digital xenobot. Different cubes represent different real-life cell identities. In the beginning, the researchers started with just two cell types, passive, like skin cells, and contractile, like cardiac cells. And they start with one objective, for the digital xenobot to move forward. The different cell cubes are then combined in a random way by the AI, and then placed into an evolutionary algorithm, which can evolve the digital xenobot over time, creating iteration after iteration until it displays the desired behavior. At first, the algorithm makes completely random designs. These digital bots don't exhibit any interesting behaviors beyond just sort of wiggling a bit. But after many thousands of generations, eventually the algorithm will produce a digital xenobot with the desired behavior moving forward. The final design of the first digital xenobot was a little blob with leg-like appendages that it could use to scuttle in a walking-like motion. The scientists then make the xenobot in the lab with the same configuration, sticking the correct cells together and sculpting it into the right shape. And sure enough, when placed in their aquatic petri dish, the bots started walking. And when placed in an orientation facing to the right, they generally always walked to the right. As hoped, the AI quite accurately predicted the way that the bots would move. The pink lines show the movement that the AI predicted, and the blue lines show the actual movement of the xenobots. With this predictable movement, the next step was to put the xenobots to the test, to see if they could move through varied environments. In mazes ranging from wide open fields to tubes as small as half a nanometer in diameter, smaller than the diameter of a human capillary. 
In all cases, the Xenobots followed the path provided by the environment. Traditional robots would have a lot of trouble navigating something this small, but the Xenobots could do so with ease. Soon, different types of locomotion were created in the bots, including bots with small cilia that beat, giving forward motion. These ones like to spin in circles. The scientists also noticed that if they injured the Xenobots, after about 10 minutes, the wounds would close and the bots would heal up. Researchers are still working to understand the intricacies of this, but it appears that self-healing is a built-in feature of these biobots, where contraction at the wound site can help close the injuries. Propelling themselves along and healing, the Xenobots were already making waves in the scientific community as a revolutionary biohybrid. But as all roboticists know, sometimes robots end up doing surprising things. Without being programmed, and without any sense or communication organs, the Xenobots spontaneously started to work together, collecting and organizing piles of debris. How is such cooperation possible by mindless little bots? A hint comes from a study done in 1999. These are sensorless robots, each with a little scoop on its front, designed simply to drive around, and in their environment are many small disks. The robots don't know about any other robots, can't sense if they're touching anything, can't tell if they're actually touching a disk. But as it randomly drives around, by chance it will eventually start pushing a disk. The robot can push one disk, or maybe two, but if it comes across a pile of disks, the robot isn't strong enough to keep pushing, so it's forced to reposition itself and let go, inadvertently adding its disk to the pile. Over time, therefore, piles of the disks spontaneously emerge. This is precisely what's happening with the Xenobots. They simply push particles by chance until they cannot, which spontaneously leads to organized piles of the debris. And even though it's a mindless and uncoordinated act, it could be a powerful tool for us one day. Scientists think this gathering behavior could allow such bots to collect microplastics from ocean water or to clear plaques from arteries in the human body. And this ability led scientists to think, what else could the xenobots aggregate? What else could they round up and make little piles out of? This is where the xenobot story gets properly freaky. First, the scientists had the AI redesign the Xenobots to optimize for collecting particles. The original sphere shape, as you might guess, isn't so great for the collection task. Instead, the computer suggested a C-shape, similar to Pac-Man, which is highly efficient at collecting loose particles. Then, the researchers added a compelling material to the Xenobot's environment, frog stem cells, the raw material of a Xenobot. And as the scientists hoped, the Xenobots dutifully swept them up into small piles just like they did with random debris. And then something remarkable happened. The piles of cells turned into new Xenobots. There are many types of reproduction in the world of organisms, from sexual to asexual, from splitting to budding to birth. These processes all share one common trait. They all come from the parent organism, one way or another. But what the Xenobots did has never before been observed in living organisms. It's called kinematic self-replication, and has only ever been observed in certain molecules. It's the act of reproducing by moving and compressing dissociated parts in the environment. And although it's never been observed in cellular life forms until now, it's possible it even played a role in the origin of multicellular life on Earth. And this ability in robotics could lead to exponential utility over time. Currently, individual xenobots can live for 10 days in an aqueous environment without needing any outside food source. This is a good start, but limits what a xenobot could do in the real world. But if xenobot raw material could be continually added to the environment, it could mean limitless generations of xenobots, which could be a real force for good. Along with clearing pollution, one day they could perhaps be programmed to selectively pick up and move specific cell types that we want to use in regenerative medicine, aggregating the materials for a body to regrow damaged tissues. 
Researchers are now working to create Xenobots that have a working memory, a read-write ability to record one bit of information, using a fluorescent marker that indicates if they've experienced something in their environment. This type of memory could help us detect the presence of things like radioactive contamination, chemical pollutants, drugs, or certain diseases. And perhaps most importantly, by understanding Xenobots, we start to understand the plasticity of living cells. Freed of their evolutionary fate, cells could be capable of astounding things. They can walk, they can swim, they can collect debris and reproduce. The question is, what else might they be able to do? As for whether or not these bots are alive is still a matter of great debate. They are made out of living cells and can reproduce, but are still very much machines. Our minds like to try to categorize, but in reality, we might need to accept that Xenobots occupy a space in between, both living and machine. For now, Xenobots are simple and lack nervous systems, but if future Biobots are capable of emotions, feelings, or pain, this quandary may need more serious consideration. Harnessing the power of biology will be the driving force behind the next century of technological developments. Whether it's understanding the raw ability of cells free of their evolutionary fate, or by analyzing the products of 3.8 billion years of evolution, the natural world has the answers we need. In our quest to beat cancer, find solutions to antibiotic resistance, respond to natural disasters, or traverse the toughest climates imaginable, our survival in the future relies on tapping in to nature's genius. And in a brand new six-part series on Curiosity Stream, you can explore this cutting edge of science with the series called Evolve. This refreshing docuseries dives deep into the emerging world of biomimicry and whether the unique adaptations of the animal world can truly help us to find futuristic solutions to some of our biggest problems. It's one of the best series on CuriosityStream. It looks at mesmerizing behaviors, like this water-gathering, butt-in-the-air behavior from a Namibian sand beetle, and searches for some of Earth's most venomous creatures, which may hold important answers in medicine. CuriosityStream is a great streaming platform, and now they've partnered with us to offer an incredible deal. By signing up to CuriosityStream, you now also get a subscription to Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform made by me and several other educational YouTube content creators. It's a place where we can upload our videos ad-free, and a place where we can experiment with new original content. On Nebula, you can watch brand new originals, like Real Engineering's Battle of Britain, which recently had its first episode drop. If ever there was a time for a history lesson on World War II, now is definitely it. The lads have really upped their game with the animations, voice acting, and storytelling, and there are several more episodes to come. So by signing up at curiositystream.com slash real science, you'll get a subscription to CuriosityStream and a subscription to Nebula for just $14.79 for the entire year. Signing up is also the best way to support this channel and all of your favorite educational content creators. And if you're looking for something else to watch right now, you can watch our previous video about the invasion of the cane toad, or watch Real Engineering's latest video, The Insane Engineering of the Parker Solar Probe.